breathing, an essential practice or overrated? I'm going to be making the argument today about breathwork being overrated. For a long time, I thought that breathwork was an essential practice. And in some instances, I'm not saying in every context, everything is contextual. In some instances, maybe a certain pattern of breathing can be useful. We use patterns of breathing in our everyday lives and during our sessions with people in order to have them understand how to expand their rib cage, how to belly breathe, how to use their diaphragm effectively but in many instances when we go overboard on breathing we have to understand that we can't oversaturate the body with one specific stimulus over and over again so before I even get into all that we have to talk about what breath work is what is breath breath work because breath work is an abstract concept right is breath work breathing, right? I already breathe. Breathing is an unconscious function of the body. But if I make it a conscious function of the body, then it can become a type of breath work. So you can sit down and then lengthen your inhale and lengthen your exhale. Usually people think of that as a type of meditation. You can focus on nose breathing, increasing your carbon dioxide tolerance is something that's been talked about in the fitness industry a lot recently. You can hyperventilate and arouse your system, <laughs> right? That's a very popular form of breath work. And here's the deal. Each form of breathing patterns likely has their, their place in the human lexicon of function and breathing. But what it starts to sound like is a different way to load your squat or a different way to you do a deadlift. I can do a deadlift with a narrow stance or I can do deadlift with a wide stance or it's just another way of kind of reboxing the same principles throughout, throughout the industry. So I'd like to make that argument, but once again, getting ahead of myself, what is breath work used for? Why do people do it? There has to be a reason why. Stress, anxiety, and I put here spirit. So I'll start with stress and anxiety because most people will, will relate to that. When you take a deep breath, and let it out, most people feel some sort of stress reduction, right? If you're in a high stress situation, what do most people say? Take a deep breath. I need you to take a deep breath and calm down, right? So even though there can be some carryover in isolated contexts, if I, if I do that breathing, what, what, what about when I'm breathing and, I, and I'm trying to arouse my system, right? That's the hyperventilating. <laughs> Right? Or maybe I don't want to be that relaxed. Maybe relax, being that relaxed would be a maladaptation, right? But that's mostly why people do it. So when we have stress and anxiety and then we use breath work, another question I would add is, are we getting to the root of the problem? Am I going to be creating a reliance on breath work to be able to solve my stress and anxiety outside the realm of what the root principle causes? The other thing that I have to account for today is spirit. Now, I was talking about Tyranny of Words last video. Tyranny of Words is a really important book that talks about abstraction. So we have to take a look at the word spirit, right? So there are studies that show a favorable outcomes for breath work, right? There's million, uh, millions, I'm exaggerating, many, many studies that talk about the effects on your amygdala and having permanent changes in the amygdala and different aspects of your brain that have to do with fear, anxiety, and our overall stress response and our reactivity to stimulus. Okay, cool, I could buy into that. But then there's also the idea of doing breath work for, in some instances, hours at a time, sitting down and breathing in order to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Now, here's the thing. It's an abstraction, right? So if we say spirit, that means a different thing to every single person. If I say whiteboard marker, that means the same thing to everybody, right? So what we have to do is we have to base our decisions more so on what we can all unequivocally agree exists. Spirit is not one of those things, unfortunately. So if when it comes to your, like, your health and your fitness and you making objective decisions in your everyday life, some people might argue that spirit is up there, but in my personal opinion, I don't think that this is something that should be taken into account when we're trying to think about what's good for our bodies, right? What, what, is, what are we thinking about in terms of an essential practice? So, and another reason I bring up spirit too, 
because we can get into abstractions and tyranny of words in another video. The other reason I bring up uh, spirit is because most of the breathwork stuff comes from Eastern philosophy. So a lot of it has yogic backgrounds or just you know backgrounds in Eastern philosophy, box breathing, the idea of mindfulness, another abstraction. We feel more mindful, we feel more present, we feel more in the now. So I, you know, I hate to disparage those things as somebody who had once been very into that. At the same time, what I've come to find is that nobody can agree on what that means unequivocally, and then we run into problems. And then we're all sitting around doing breath work and breathing and not really solving any problems that really matter. Meditate or hyperventilate. That's what I was saying in terms of the different types of breath work. You can sit down and meditate and lengthen your breath and lengthen your exhales. That's mostly, right, you can, you can breathe in, hold your breath for a moment, breathe out, that's called box breathing. You can do the hyperventilation, which is actually arousal of the system. Some people do that with breath holds, right? So here's what I'll say. That's the types of breathing. That's pretty much the overview of what breath work is, in case there's anybody who didn't know that. But I wanted everybody to know what I was referring to because once again, everybody has a practice. That's once again kind of something from Eastern philosophy or from yoga. What is your practice? And at first it was a yoga practice, but now in the industry, it's kind of turned into, yeah, your practice can be anything. Your practice can be watching Oprah in the morning for an hour and then taking a couple of deep breaths, right? So what we have to recognize is that there's practices that our that are objectively better for our health than others, okay? So when we have a practice, and we talk about that, there is an aspect of breath work that we are a proponent of in terms of functional patterns, my opinion, my personal opinion as well. Functional orthodontics, right? So, whoa, what is functional orthodontics? We're coming out of left field with the ortho stuff, right? But not really, actually. So a lot of times people breathe through their mouths, okay? So if we're talking about breath work, I figured I may as well just throw this in here. You don't, when you, when you breathe through your mouth, it's an, an inefficient way of breathing, okay? So you wanna focus on breathing through your nose. That's a big aspect of what we call functional orthodontics, and you should look up Dr. Mew to learn more, more information about that and myofunctional therapy, just to get an overview, especially if you have children, this is something that you're gonna to wanna to know about. In many instances, when kids get stuffy noses, they end up doing mouth breathing. And when they end up doing mouth breathing, it actually affects their posture, the strength of their tongue, the way that their maxilla actually ends up developing, the way their cranium and skull develops, right? So if you, if one mouth breathes, then we get at a negative effect on the way that our for, the way that our facial structure actually develops. You'll develop a more narrow stru facial structure. Your posture will become more poor and less efficient. And if you push the tongue to your roof of the mouth and breathe through your nose, then the lips are sealed. And on top of the facial and cranial changes, you're also going to create nitric oxide for your body. There's actually a chemical response that happens through your nasal and airway that doesn't happen when you breathe through your mouth. So mouth breathing is a less efficient way of breathing, except for the most intense forms of exercise where you're absolutely exhausted and going absolutely full out, then mouth breathing might be called for this <laughs> kind of panting action. But otherwise, nose breathing all the way here, guys. There's so much research on this. It's not even something I feel like I have to justify. People, people are finally really coming around to this. But if you have allergies, if you have a clogged nose, if you have a tendency to store, you gotta handle it. Handle it, do it now. It's pivotal for your health. Don't delay, breathe through your nose, okay? So that's what I'm saying. There are practices, there are aspects of breath work that make more sense to do than others. And since breath work is an abstraction, I'm just taking the reins and saying, all right, we're gonna talk about breath work, we're gonna talk about nose breathing as well. All right, so nose breathing, lots of research on that. I'm gonna leave it to you guys to take care of that. Here's what I say here with let's make it complicated, right? Breath work, let's make it super complicated. Let's make it a hundred different ways to breathe and keep reboxing the same thing. And then if that doesn't solve your problems, there's another way to breathe or it's you or it's your spirit or whatever the case may be, right? So that's why I wrote here, let's make it complicated because 
you, we keep reboxing these same, like breathwork has been around for a long time. And now all of a sudden people are talking about it like it's this essential thing and there aren't aspects to it that, like it's, it's really only about like 5% of the equation when it comes to your health and when it comes to really even stress and anxiety. Um, because you have to think about how you interact with your environment as well. If you have somebody that has poor posture and doesn't interact with their environment in, an, in a confident and uh, assertive manner, then breath work isn't going to solve that person's problems. If anything, it's probably just going to make them more anxious. But I'll get into that uh, later on. But that's why I wrote Let's Make It Complicated here, because breathing is not necessarily something that we have to overcomplicate. Breathing is a subconscious function, and in many instances, as we'll talk about later, if you work on your mechanics, then you're going to have better breathing mechanics. And, and I'll explain why in a moment. There's actually a very convincing study that came out recently with pretty updated tech that's very interesting and a strong supporter of this argument. Um, so another thing that I wrote here is not useless, just not that useful, right? So what I'm talking about is that, it, it, like I said, it only accounts for a certain percentage of the equation. As somebody's working on their mechanics, maybe they've been through some sort of deep trauma, they may need to sit down and breathe for a minute and not do anything and take it easy and reduce their stress levels and be in a room by themselves without so many like stimulating things in their environment. That could be very important, but that's not going to, they have to come out of that room eventually and deal with the real world. So how they deal with the real world is ultimately going to be the deciding factor of how much anxiety and stress that person has. That's the thing when it comes to why zebras don't get ulcers. Why zebras don't get ulcers is really good at talking about the stress response that people get in society. When a zebra is chased by a lion, it has a stress response, and then after a certain period of time, if it should it escape from the line and not get eaten, it calms down and gets to homeostasis relatively quickly. When a human goes through a stress level, that should be the same thing. You have a certain amount of stress, you would deal with the stress and anxiety from that, and then you can return to homeostasis. But in the modern, in our modern environment, the stress is prolonged, and it's in, and stress is prolonged in very inefficient postures, and this leads to degeneration over time. So what we want to do is eventually get back to kind of being like the zebra. We go through a stress response, and then we're able to return to homeostasis. But one thing I want to point out is that a zebra doesn't have to do breath work. So why is it that a zebra can be chased by a lion, literally getting attacked and almost ruthlessly eaten by a lion, and then it's able to go, once it escapes, it's able to go into its herd and chill out and be completely fine. If you were chased by a lion or me or whatever, we might have trouble coming down from that if we didn't have the correct kind of ideology behind reducing that stress reduction, okay? So just a couple things to think about there. Why zebras don't get ulcers? Read more about that if you want to know more about your hormones, your response to stress, modern cardiovascular disease, and why we adapt to things that the way that we do for, to our modern lifestyles. Very, very important research by Dr. Robert Sapolsky. So another thing that I want to take into account is, so in, in regards to that, just real quick, it's just that it's not useless. You can use breath work to help with that. It's just not that useful, okay? It, that person who's having stress and anxiety in their daily life through prolonged stressors through their job or whatever the case may be, you have to solve those things directly or you have to become a more resilient human, okay? Which is not just sitting down and breathing. It's more complicated than that. So does conscious breathing influence subconscious breath? Yeah, I would say the verdict is still out. Actually, it's two different parts of the brain that influences conscious breath to subconscious breath. I don't think it necessarily refers to like our, the meditative practice that I'm mostly talking about or the state of arousal. Um, that's what people try to like increase their lung capacity and stuff like that. I'm not 100% sure about that. That might take require a conscious practice if you're a diver or something like that, and then that would, you know, carry over. But generally speaking, like for example, this panting, we would normally only be doing that if we were sprinting, right? Or exercising or running in some manner, right? It would only be during our most intense forms of, 
of stress that we're doing this type of like panting. So if we're doing it subconsciously, does that carry over to our conscious life? Does that make my, con my subconscious breathing more efficient and then therefore influence my mechanics and make me a more efficient human? I'm not 100% sure about that. I would argue that since it's two different areas of the brain, then probably not. There doesn't seem to be a lot of research on that. Like I said, really when it comes to breath work, there's a lot of claims. So I'm actually glad I'm getting into that because you know, there are claims that are like, oh, it's, you know, it'll make your immune system stronger. And maybe just by reducing your stress in an indirect way, it can, but you know, and then spiritual enlightenment and all this stuff, and it's just, I don't know if I buy it. I gotta be honest with you guys. From what I've seen in the research, the only thing that we can prove is that it affects your amygdala and can have positive effects on that. But what if one already had efficient breathing mechanics and then you just chilled out for a little while? Is that a type of meditation, just like sitting in my room and not having a whole bunch of stimulus around me? Is it meditating or is it just not being under stress in your environment. You see what I'm saying here, guys? It turns into a semantic thing. So if you just like spend some time and you're relaxing, then it, because you have good mechanics and your body's able to do that, then is that the same as uh, an actual meditation in order to bring down my stress levels, right? Do I have to sit there and do deep breath work for 20 minutes in order to reduce my anxiety? It shouldn't have to be that way. Remember the zebra. I can't talk all this smack on breath work without giving you guys some sort of tools to be able to reduce your stress and anxiety. And I'm gonna give it to you right now, okay? Get ready. It's gonna be a really big surprise. Your Mechanics is a huge aspect of reducing your anxiety and becoming a more resilient human. Your mechanics, okay? What do I mean by your mechanics? I mean your posture, your body language, the way that you interact with your environment. This is a, these are mechanical principles here, guys. It's not some sort of abstract concept. We're talking about the nuts and bolts, right? I'll mention another person here, Jacques Fresco. If you guys haven't heard about Jacques Fresco, then you need to start researching him. It's not guruism, guys. It's not because I just love Jacques Fresco and I want everybody to know about him. It's because he understands the world in the eyes of an engineer, right? This is why we use words like mechanics. That's why we talk about biomechanics, right? If you are a mechanist, then you are talking about things in our reality that can be objectively measured. This is the way that engineers speak to one another, right? So that's why we say mechanics. The way that your body is built is a huge aspect of how, this is your vessel. This is the way that you interact with the reality and it has to be taken into account before we start doing other things, right? This is when it comes to first principles. So we have to start with mechanics first and then build up from there, right? Build it from the ground up. Okay, so how else to combat stretch? Body language and anxiety, that's the segue, okay? Body language and anxiety, I remember I said that earlier. Is somebody who does a whole bunch of breath work but still has really poor posture and shy demeanor, that person is going to have anxiety no matter how long they breathe for, right? So. It, it, your body language is accounted for almost 90% of communication. It's a lot, right? Tone of voice is a big one too. But what you actually say is only about 7% of people's communication. Nonverbal communication is the majority of it. As a matter of fact, you register somebody's body language before anything else. The way that they're standing, the way that they carry themselves, that is already giving you and them a hormonal response. That brings me to another thing. Mechanotransduction, I'm just gonna jump straight to it. Building resiliency. So everything that you do, right? It, hormone drives behavior and behavior drives hormones. That's why look up Robert Sapolsky, definitely start researching him if you wanna know more about that. We're gonna be talking about mechanotransduction, which sounds like a super fancy word, and 
it's not something that's well known yet in the industry. It, it is in physical therapy, but they're kind of looking at it at a very kind of cursory level, right? Mechanotransduction, we have to, we have to realize that any time that you facilitate a mechanical stimulus on your body, your cells create a chemical signaling that communicates to other cells to tell them how to adapt. So people know about this, but they don't, but then they know about it and then they don't really consider the implications of that, right? So if we want to build resiliency, it's probably a good idea to take into account how our cells adapt to the forces placed on them in our physical reality, right? So when we talk about mechanotransduction, we can't talk about building a resilient human without considering all of that and having those implications. So am I going to have a better hormonal profile if I have great mechanics through the process of mechanotransduction? Yeah, probably. My mitochondria is probably going to work better. My cell biology is going to work better. And there's lots of studies on mechanotransduction, guys. So w this is something that we'll be putting in the caption so that way you can read more about it. And we're going to be doing a video that goes way more in depth on mechanotransduction overall. But I want you to know, there may not be a lot of studies, for example, on the exact body language and anxiety. There, there's been, there was a TED talk, I believe her name's Amy Cuddy. She was talking about she conducted a study taking a salivary very hormone profile of people who did power postures, raising their hands, putting their hands on their hips, taking assertive postures. And then th there were some implications of that and then they haven't been able to replicate those studies since then. The truth is, is that the link of body language and posture to your hormonal profile is still very sparse. But if you look at Robert Sapolsky, and he's talked about how the hierarchy of your place in a social structure determines your hormone profile as well. So people in a higher place in the social hierarchy they actually have higher levels of testosterone and lower stress levels, which is really interesting, right? So your body language is going to account for how you respond in your place in the social hierarchy. So there are clues. There may not be established exact research, but remember when we talked about research anyways, guys, we can't completely depend on that. We, that's another thing with Jacques Fresco. We have to rely on our intuition to a certain extent, okay? I don't need all of the pieces of a puzzle to know how the final piece looks. And mechanotransduction is likely going to be a huge missing piece of the puzzle. So coming in from the broad view now and zeroing back in on breath work, a lot of people do breath work to combat stress. What I'm saying here is that if you wanna combat stress, turn into a more resilient human through the correct mechanical leverage. Why do I say that? When it comes to your rib cage, there are, there are other reasons why you may not just want to pound breath work in an isolated manner. Because you evolved to do things a certain way. Evolution matters. We can't even entertain saying that evolution doesn't exist, guys. We know it exists, we know it happened, we know, we understand kind of the through line of evolution. Everybody was an amoeba, then they were a fish, then fish started coming out of the water, they became reptiles, they became mammals, right? Obviously there are different branches, not every reptile became a mammal, not every mammal became an ape, right? But what I'm telling you is that the, your evolution as a vertebrate, you are a vertebrate. You have a spine. This is what I'm talking about with abstractions because you'd be surprised at what people argue, right? So we have to objectively measure that you and I are vertebrates and that we evolved to walk and to run and to throw, right, the big four and to stand, okay? And then just to further emphasize that, there's a really great study that we'll link below. There were a group of scientists that were x-raying lizards in real time. In the past, we haven't been able to x-ray movement in real time to be able to see the insides of organisms while they're moving, right? When you take an x-ray, what happens? You like go in this thing and then they take the x-ray and, and you have to stay very still, right? Now, scientists have just now been able to, this is a very recent study too, they've been able to analyze the rib cages of lizards while they're walking on a treadmill. 
And what they've been able to find, they had hypothesized earlier on in terms of the evolutionary through line as animals were coming up out of the water, they probably developed a rib cage and that helped them move because the way that you move in water and the way an organism moves in land is very different. And then that probably co-opted for something like breathing, but now they've confirmed that. So your rib cage, before you are a vertebrate, you have a rib cage, before your rib cage as a vertebrate evolved to breathe, your rib cage actually was evolved to assist in your movement first, okay? So this is established science here, guys. When we're walking, our rib cage is not just meant to have the rise and fall of our relaxed state in a seated posture or whatever the, or lying down while we're sleeping, whatever the case may be. What about your breathing mechanics when you're moving? And as a matter of fact, in terms of the hierarchy of prioritization, your rib cage mechanics while you're in motion, which influence your breathing mechanics, is more important than breath work in an isolated instance. As a matter of fact, if we think about functional patterns principles and we think about utilizing things in isolation, we try not to do that, right? That's why I started your rib cage and kinetic chain. So we understand the evolution of the rib cage now about how that was developed for movement first and then co-opted for breathing later. What we have to remember is that your rib cage is also connected to many different kinetic chains. We know this through the anatomy trains, right? Thomas Myers, he's talked about this. It's not new information. But the way that people talk about myofascial chains, people still do things in isolation. So if we're accepting that kinetic chains connect to our rib cage and we're accepting that isolated work isn't as efficient as work or a way of exercise that takes the myofascial chains into account, then when we breathe in isolation, <sighs> could I be exacerbating the same, uh, my myofascial chains and disrupting their efficiency in the same manner as when I do an isolated bicep curl that doesn't account for myofascial chains, right? If I just do this bicep curl with terrible posture, what happens? People get neck problems and a shortened pec minor, for example, just one of many, and they ended up getting costoclavicular compression. And the same type of thing can happen with the efficiency of your mechanics when you are hammering an isolated variable like breathing, okay? At least that's the hypothesis here, guys. Okay, we don't have established science on this yet, but as we're working on people and seeing people on a daily basis and we're like, I don't know if it's analogous to what we're thinking about in myofascial chains, the probability is it's going to be very similar when you're pounding out breath work, whether it be in the woods trying to find spiritual enlightenment or you're trying to hyperventilate to wake yourself up in the morning, whatever the case may be, or jump into a cold shower. I don't know what people are doing nowadays, but it's quite a, it's very, let's make it complicated. It's very complicated when they could be focusing on their mechanics, which is probably going to give them a better return on their investment, okay? The last thing that I wanna talk about here, breathing asymmetries and hyperflacidity or hyperflacid tendencies. Imagine that you are in a yoga class and they're doing their final breath work and everybody's breathing, okay? Let's say my left side rib cage is very compressed and then I take a deep breath. Okay, and then I do that over and over and over and over and over again. Your neuromuscular system gets better at whatever it practices right away. So if I continue that breath work over and over and over and over again with that asymmetry, aren't I going to be exacerbating that asymmetry? Am I going to be disrupting the ratios of how my body evolved to move, evolution matters, we have to take that into account before we do things, right? So if that's the case, then when I'm breathing and exacerbating asymmetries, then I'm getting a negative ROI on my breath work, okay? So that's what, now hyperflacidity, what is that, right? So these are all new videos, so I'm trying to explain it as if you don't know anything about what that word means. If I have to think about the reference point of gait, evolution, we're even talking about the rib cage, how it evolved from movement first, movement is gait. If I think about that, and then I think about the ratios of how my whole myofascial chains, my bone structure, et cetera, how that moves underneath a reference point of gait, there's certain ratios of movement that are more efficient than others. So if I consider all of that and, I, and, I'm, do, and I'm trying to 
we're trying it at functional patterns to make them as efficient and close to perfect as possible, and then I do a whole bunch of breath work, then that's not taking in those ratios into account because my ribs connect to kinetic chains. So I'm disrupting my kinetic chain because all those kinetic chains connect to my rib cage. So that's what we're talking about in terms of hyperflaccid tendencies, okay? But you can't, now here's the thing, people will say, oh, well, you know, humans are as asymmetrical. Okay, yes, but we want to be as symmetrical as possible. So just because I have a certain amount of asymmetries doesn't mean I just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? It doesn't mean that I'm just like, well, I just accept it and I'm just gonna be asymmetrical and who cares? No, we're gonna do our absolute best to try to become as symmetrical as possible because the best, the most bad humans in the world, in other words, the most efficient, the strongest, the most resilient, the le most resilient to stress, more than likely had good symmetry, right? They had good attractive qualities. And because of that, they probably had a higher place in a social hierarchy and they probably had lower cortisol and higher testosterone uh, amongst other things, right? I don't know the exact hormone profile, but they, have more, they are more resilient to stress and to life's obstacles, okay? So I wanted to draw attention to something here. It's called the Pareto Principle. Now, some of you might already know what the Pareto Principle is. 20% of what you do gives you 80% of the returns. So I'm mentioning this here just because I like to, like I talked about Jacques Fresco, I talked about how zebras don't get ulcers, I talked about tyranny of words, I'm talking about the Pareto Principle, right? You want to spend your time doing things that objectively matter and that objectively give you the most ROI for your time. A lot of people like to play this stupid game where they're like, oh, it just doesn't matter and I can spend my time doing whatever I want. It's all about on an individual basis, even though we're all humans and we all share a, the same amount of genetic DNA. So we actually should all be doing very similar things more than likely. But the Pareto principle is 20% of what you do gives you 80% of the returns. I would argue that working on your mechanics actually gives you even more than that, okay? So consider that before you spend all this time doing breath work in the, for the sake of stress and anxiety, try working on your mechanics and tell me that you don't have a more efficient ROI for your time. Okay, guys? So I think that pretty much covers the skinny on breath work. Thanks for joining me today and keeping an open mind. And I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from and you'll take the opportunity to work on your mechanics and consider how your body works in a new way.